like to invite Dr. Gunjan Saluja, who has been moderating this entire session very efficiently. Dr. Gunjan Saluja is presently working as oculoplasty and star business consultant at Bhilai Chhattisgarh. We are happy to have you here. Doctor, over to you. Yeah, wait. Yes, we can see your presentation, ma'am. Maybe uh, make it to full screen. Yeah, yeah, just give me a minute. Perfect. A very good after, a very good evening, everyone. Uh, my topic today is management of canalicular obstruction, the new ways ahead. At the outside, I would like to thank uh, AIOS for giving me this opportunity. So coming to canalicular blocks, canalicular blocks can be widely classified as proximal, distal, and common canalicular blocks, depending upon where are we finding the stop from the puncta. So to label it at, as a proximal uh, canalicular block, we should find a soft stop on probing up to 4 mm. For distal, it is a soft stop on probing at 5 to 10 mm. And common canalicular blocks are the ones in which the soft stops are present on probing at 10 mm from the puncta. So this this is how the normal anatomy is. And if the block is up to 4 mm, anywhere here, that will be labeled as proximal canalicular block. And when it is beyond that, that is at 5 to 10 mm, then that can be labeled as a distal canalicular block. So the common causes which are there are either most of them are idiopathic, some of them can be congenital, uh, could be secondary to neoplasms, sickest tracing lesions. Uh, very uh, rarely because of uh, medications and sometimes post-traumatic also we can find these canalicular obstructions. So if you look at the con uh, conventional modalities of the treatment of uh, these canalicular obstructions, they usually they are very uh, tedious and they have a large number of complications like tube migration, obstruction of tube, extrusion of tube, and secondary infection, collection of secretions and diplopia. Moreover, they have variable success rates and surgery may not be the best option, especially in patients who are uh, at the extremes of ages like children and elderly debilitated patients who have multiple systemic illness. So what can be the safer options is what we are searching for now. Mostly, uh, if we have a proximal canalicular block, lacrimal Botox is one of the best options we can opt for. Uh, lacrimal Botox uh, is given in the main and necessary lacrimal glands who's, uh, who have a significant contribution to the basal and reflex tear production. Uh, it actually blocks the presynaptic release of acetylcholine, which is required for the tear secretion. The lacrimal Botox is uh, given directly. In, uh, we are giving 2.5 units per 0.1 ml of Botox uh, directly into the palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland under visualization. Patient is asked, uh, this is an OPD procedure, and patient is asked to look at the intranasal direction, and the lid is retracted. One can use a Desmas retractor also to expose the palpebral lobe. Post-injection, uh, sometimes... Dry eyes can be a problem and hence artificial tears are usually advised. The review, if you look at the review of literature, various studies have proven its efficacy and have shown favorable outcomes with the non-surgical botulinum toxin. And they are actually safe. Uh, my experience has also been the same, especially in patients who are having proximal canalicular blocks, botulinum toxin does play a very important and a very good role and, very, and has good results with that. So the advantages are that it is easy, uh, it's less invasive, it is safe and reversible. Usually the effect lasts for around three months, but again, yes, repeated injections have to be given mostly th thrice or uh, four times we have to repeat the injections at the interval of around two to three months. Trephination is another option, which is usually preferred in patients who are having distal canalicular blocks. So distal canalicular blocks, um, in these patients, one can use trephination. A mini trephine is a 21 gauge stainless steel tube, which is having a diameter of 0.181 mm and has a length of 16 mm. It is provided with a plastic handle and has a hub and an intraluminal stellate. Uh, excuse me for a minute.
uh, I'm really sorry for the interruption. Uh, so basically, it is having a stellate, which is metallic stellate and a plastic handle. And it can be used with a uh, syringe uh, or to a special unit. Actually, that can be used for the injection of mitomycin C if one needs to prevent the uh, formation of any post-operative uh, adhesions. So I would like to show a surgical video for the same. So first of all, local anesthesia is uh, given and puncta is dilated. Now following uh, the punctal dilatation, a probing is done to recheck our findings. Once we have confirmed that, uh, and we have now, as in this case, we found that the obstruction was at around 12 to 14 mm. Then we proceeded with the trephination. Uh, in this, uh, the trephine is introduced with the rolling movements of the hand. And following that, one can feel, uh, once we are crossing those fibrous adhesions, one can feel the giveaway feeling and a heart stop can be felt at the end. Mitomycin C uh, can be injected in this stage to prevent the post-operative adhesions. Syringing is done usually to check the patency of the passage. It is, it is simple procedure, it is less invasive. However, stent extrusion, at the end of the procedure, a mini monoca stent is placed so as to maintain the patency of the canaliculus. Uh, however, stent extrusion is one of the important limitation. Uh, pyogenic granuloma, false passage formation and recurrences are some of the important limitations of this procedure. The reported success rate is around 52 to 92% in various studies. Laser canaliculoplasty is something which I have not experienced. I have uh, no experience in this, but it has been reported to be another non-invasive procedure in which canalicular obstructions can be opened using a modified Bowman's probe with a diameter of 1.1. The probe is attached to endoscopic and laser systems and a YAG laser of 800 nanometer is used to open the canalicular obstruction. The reported uh, limitations of laser canaliculoplasty include the epithelization of canalicular surface, delayed or abnormal healing, and predisposition to synechial closure. A balloon canaliculoplasty, uh, again, I have no experience in this, but has been reported, uh, that involves the transcanalicular placement of balloon catheter under fluoroscopic guidance at the site of stenosis to mechanically dilate and relieve the obstruction. Uh, the reported anatomic success rate was 40% at two years follow-up. Hence, the take-home message from this is canalicular obstructions can be managed in a simpler way using the less invasive methods like trephination and lacrimal Botox. And this is especially true in children, chronically ill debilitated patients and in patients who are having multiple systemic illnesses. Although they might not need to be repeated, but they are simple and can be done as a minor procedure. You need not uh, need a separate OT. Also, sometimes it is just an OPD procedure which can be done. It saves time and reduces stress for the patient and surgeon also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gunjan. Uh, do we have